Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out. We're a nice, uh, select, cosy group uh, tonight. Uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, well known to many of you. Now, we can cheer us up here and up back. David Jones from the Department of Anesthesia and Pain Management. And um, his intriguing topic tonight is uh, the story of Dr. Isaiah de Zouf, early medical practitioner in Dunedin and the first um, University of Otago lecturer in diseases of children. And um, what caught my eye, of course, down the bottom is that he uh, advised that Greek should be compulsory knowledge for medicine, which I strongly endorse. I think it should be absolutely part of the medical course, including that. And so I'm looking forward to hearing your views on that. So, no further news. <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you. Uh, thank you, Terry. Well, we're going to get uh, warm in here tonight. It's very close and tight. Yeah. But all the best people came first. Uh, we we see it's left at the back, I think. <coughs> a couple there, others. Anyway, Dr. Isaiah de Zouch was just uh, a simple name to me in 1992 when the professor leaving our department mentioned his name in an overall view of anaesthesia in Dunedin, and I thought a little nothing more of that. I, I never read his paper about it or anything like that. And about two years ago, he came out alive. Uh, if some of you will come to my previous talk about Dr. Kloss, who was the first uh, graduate from the Otago University Medical School, and uh, right next to his name is Dr. Isaiah Zouch. So in the two years since I first became aware of that, which is um, in a place that some of you who go in the hospital will uh, uh, know a little bit about. Uh, this is called Radiology Corner to me, and there's um, in this uh, board here a list of names, uh, it's an honours board for people past, and uh, the left hand side are those who died while in office, and those the right hand side are those who died after they've been in office for more than 10 years. And uh, we have here the uh, top few names, and uh, Dr. De Zouch is uh, on the right, just uh, not far from my last subject. I, from knowing nothing about him, I've uh, come to feel I've uh, learnt a lot about him. I've online contacted people who are connected with his family, and as recently as two weeks ago, I got some uh, provenance of the family history, which I'll share with you. Um, so. It's quite a ramp uh, tonight to get through all the things I'd like to tell you. There's an awful lot I'm going to miss out as well. Uh, so uh, there's a question about whether he was a physician or surgeon. <coughs> Clearly my last subject was mostly a surgeon, uh, but this uh, gentleman's uh, a mixture. And um, he wrote quite a few interesting socially connected treatises, which a few of, a few of which I will uh, reveal tonight. So starting off with his family origins, um, he was born in, in Dublin, Ireland, and, and had a twin, twin brother who died at about the age of one. The, the, answer, the paternal side ancestors were Huguenot immigrants from France uh, uh, for the religious uh, problems there, but the family name that, we, that Isaiah ended up with was a, an evolution from uh, de Souche in France, and uh, I'll show you more about the provenance of that later. So I've managed to uh, uh, locate some uh, records that um, uh, describe that family's uh, provenance fully. And uh, his, uh, his mother's ancestors were entirely Irish. So we have one anchoring point in the official records uh, for the UK, Ireland, which uh, is uh, Isaiah's uh, great-great-grandparents. Uh, that marriage is uh, reflected in an in a index fairly uh, clear. That was all I had until a couple of weeks ago. Uh, take notice of these people here because uh, they were the ones who fled from France and first put the roots down in Ireland. Uh, this is uh, on the left a translation of the main parts of a, a document which uh, is called a copy for uh, Isaiah's brother, uh, Charles um, uh, de Zouche, and uh, th this is been uh, uh, extracted from the College of Heraldry and Noble Archives and Nobility Archives in France. Uh, so the family has a coat of arms, which I'm not 
going to try and present to you if I translate the, the description of it there from this, uh, this document which is the family provenance uh, it would um, tell you that it's got a, a base of uh, the terrace is the bottom part of the shield and it's uh, in the colour that comes from a particular place and uh, it's uh, crested with a, a helmet and some adornment so there's a, a, a knightly uh, family uh, background connection to that the colour that is described specifically is a red ochre uh, colour that uh, comes from a particular place, and I'll just show you where that is briefly. It's up here in uh, uh, northern Turkey, and uh, it's been used uh, for, for ages as a pigment colour. So pressing on with the family uh, provenance, this uh, is translated in the next slide uh, in, a, in a slightly abbreviated form. Uh, they are the people who looked at the, what they've got stored and the archives in their possession and uh, they've given this attestation to the rest of the family history which is all written out in French like this. I'm not going to give you the rest of that. Um, it, it has a seal on it but the one that this came from uh, has just got a circle on the bottom to say there was a seal because somebody has handwritten copied it for Isaiah's brother. Uh, this is Isaiah's uh, father, uh, Louis Henry de Zouche, and uh, at the time the attestation of the um, history was done, Isaiah de Zouche in Ireland was the uh, current representative of the family. Once again, just uh, translating from the originals, uh, that Claude de Zouche, the one that, um, or de Zouche as he came away, uh, was a royal notary of Pitou. And uh, to be a royal notary is uh, a, a, a significant status. And they, they left. And uh, then uh, this, this gentleman here is the, um, is the great great grandfather of Isaiah. And for some reason, Isaiah had in his possession a legal document that was uh, written out, and the, uh, the, the, the lawyer or the notary that wrote it up can use the name uh, de Zouche as in there, all the way through it. But when Isaac signed it, uh, he used the, his original name, perhaps a slip, a Freudian slip. But anyway, that's the, the, the link that uh, indicates that the family name was changed to get uh, more like the sound of the French word rather than uh, uh, how the English uh, would say it, an S. Just to see where Pitou is, that's uh, this uh, western part of France which is not too much for travel to go around to Ireland up there. And note that um, uh, and, and uh, Niort was the wife of Claude who, who took off with his uh, family and brother and a few others, there were 16 of them left all together. In that. And it was pretty dangerous uh, travelling through the countryside at night etc to get away. So that's the Huguenot uh, link to Isaiah and uh, we'll press on with this but the um, notice the, the description that comes out of the, uh, the uh, attestation has described them as AQA throughout uh, correct pronunciation AQA and uh, that means like in English probably a squire or a protector of uh, the person who is a, is a knight and the carrier of the shield even so there's a number of them there. They are clearly a notable a set of uh, notable uh, people, and that's just taken off the other. Now there is another document from the Huguenot Society in London, which was written ten years later, that uh, uh, re redescribes all this. And interestingly, the author is a person who was a medical. Um, uh, doctor as well, a licentiate of the Royal College of Surgeons Ireland. And uh, for the meantime, just take note of the, um, of the crest, of the um, uh, symbol or logo that they used. Uh, it says around it, uh, sort of forever guarding the, the faith, uh, and translated. And you'll see there's a little boat in there, which is uh, significant for some of the rest of the story. 
Uh, so there we are, the ones that left, and uh, just a brief uh, view of the man that uh, rewrote that history in, uh, in England uh, for the London Society and presenting it. And I think what he presented was on first aid and civil life uh, as a medical doctor. Coming to his, uh, his parents, uh, his father is on the left there, and he is described in records as, a, as an upholsterer. But um, at, uh, well before Isaiah went to, to medical school, he um, would have traveled to uh, New York, it's just, it says, uh, Philadelphia, uh, to really reside permanently. And quite a lot of the family, there's a lot of the family that are nested around there. So that photo has got uh, dated 1860 on the back. Um, Using an 1870 uh, medical register, we find this much out about uh, Isaiah, and I'll put that into a more readable form here. He graduated with his uh, licentiate in medicine in 1862 from this hospital, or these hospitals actually, because there's some quite interesting things about those. Uh, also uh, ducked over to the UK and got his MRC uh, S and later did a, an MD at the Queen's University of Ireland. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to find out what his, his theme or thesis was for his MD. So he's got a, a, a picture here of about eight years' worth of his experience that predated his uh, shifting off to other parts of the world. And you'll notice that he was a, an assistant physician in the, the infirmary for children in Liverpool, and he wrote, before this uh, register came out, he'd written this one... Uh, uh, subject on sea sickness, and not forgetting that Liverpool is right alongside the, a lot of seaports. Uh, but he would have travelled uh, a couple of times before that uh, with his parents, uh, and then he'd come back to Ireland for his medical education. In that um, in that uh, record, he gave uh, Pembroke Place, Liverpool, his um, his address, and. Uh, just looking at his qualification in surgery, uh, I'd like to point out that he had a New Zealand examiner amongst those <laughs> the panel. You might not have seen that one, but anyway, that's... Uh, that, and he gave Pennsylvania as his address, which would be where the parents and quite a few of his, uh, what his siblings have uh, come to reside. So the, he, he the fair bit of his training at the Ledwich uh, what was sometimes called the original school of anatomy in, uh, in Dublin. And uh, Thomas Ed uh, Ledwich was a, an anatomist, and uh, they later named the place after him. But this is not Isaiah's certificate, this is a, a, a representation of saying. And uh, if you read out what it says on the other side, you might have a little smile. Dr. X performed this with his own hand the several operations on the dead under our supervision and to our perfect satisfaction. <laughs> the, the old Coombe lying in hospital in Dublin and uh, then the Queen's University in, of, in, of Ireland, but it's in Belfast. There's a whole group of them have had names that have gone between each other over the, over the years. Queen's uh, University of Ireland was set up to give people an education in meds, uh, an education no matter what their religious backgrounds are. So shortly after he's qualified with his MD in 1865, this photo has a London School of Photography marked on the back and taken a year later. And uh, it didn't take long for him to take, draw a straight line from one, one part of the geography to the other to go from Ireland to Liverpool. And uh, these, these photos are all available online and were in a series for sale. I think they had something like 50 pounds each of them a few years ago. But uh, they're all dated. And note, the photographer is... Uh, Australia. Australia. <laughs> a couple more that are a, a year or two later and still the same photographer. And this one is in the family archives. So just a little bit of a look of how far he would have had to walk from his 96 Pembroke uh, residence to the Royal uh, the Liverpool Infirmary for Children. It's not that far. By uh, Google it would say, or by Google Maps it would say about uh, 13 to 14 minutes, but you know, it's quite a long way to go for an emergency in the middle of the night. <laughs> it may have been harder in those days, who knows. Now, 
uh, there's one more piece of information came out by looking at some uh, contemp more contemporary stuff. That, so this is um, out of out of chronological sequence, but um, it, it says that he was a physician to the Starfield Hospital for fever in Liverpool. And uh, although that's uh, at about the time he arrived in New Zealand, his advertisement for going to practice, it tells us one thing that these other register records did not. And uh, I've left Dr. Monsell there. Uh, his practice out of it because they're on the same plaque down the corridor. Now the the um, newspaper described a bit of a, a spat between the residents and uh, they weren't too happy about bringing together all the smallpox cases at the Starfield house which they said was um, in the charge of Dr. Dezouche and uh, uh, Dr. Zouche was present when this uh, group of people headed by the Reverend Mr. Carpenter came to uh, try and complain. Uh, they, they, there's no commentary about what their point of view was. <laughs> so we, ten years later we find a, a New Zealand medical register which adds one more item at the bottom uh, that would have come after his uh, UK register record and that is that um, you know, on relapse, he's written on relapsing fever as well so that presumably comes out of that experience. So, on seasickness, uh, he possibly had experienced it, but now he's going to go and uh, put it into real practice by making a number of voyages as a ship's surgeon. And uh, the, the first uh, one was about five years uh, after his Liverpool, oh sorry, about five years later than writing that, he did this um, a series of trips which were confined off the Queensland University uh, government data and uh, the first one was the Star Queen. Uh, did anybody read the word skullduggery in the advertisement? Uh, well, certainly skullduggery on the Star Queen. Uh, the rest of the records there I think have been switched by whoever the archivists were because the dates don't match up for when he went with his wife uh, in his last voyage before New Zealand. So even official records can be wrong. I bought the boat there again, and uh, if you go through the family records, lots of people in his family disappeared. They took voyages to sea and never came back. So it seemed a little bit like the salt water might have been running through the family's blood. And these are the main main ones. His last voyage to Australia was uh, after marrying Mary. We'll come back to later. And so the Star Queen. He's listed as the surgeon superintendent and uh, sailed from London in 75. That's 10 years after his MD. That's what it looked like. Um, but, uh, the, he wrote a diary which is in the archives in uh, Queensland and uh, that would possibly make it more interesting reading but I haven't got that. But my eyes on it exactly yet. But this diary uh, effectively um, is about a boat that as it came into the um, Moreton Bay of Queensland became the subject of an inquiry because there had been numerous complaints made by Isaiah himself and the passengers, and it uh, had been deliberately understocked, it was discovered. Uh, the purser falsified the scales of weight, so there were legal requirements for how much food you had to be given, take on per passenger per day, and uh, so their, their weights, but the weights that the purser was using were underweight, undersized, so that was one thing. Not only that, but there weren't sufficient supplies for that uh, level of delivery either. Isaiah did get a testimonial from his passengers, uh, well, the passengers later, and our unfeigned admiration for you, you discharging your duties. His duty as certain superintendent is to, like the captain of an aircraft, is responsible for all their well-being. So um, the there was there were references to to this and. Um, the uh, a, a newspaper item came out as I was quick off the mark to uh, complain that there were inaccuracies in it. The day after it came out, he, uh, he wrote back and uh, said that yesterday, uh, uh, paragraphs with statements which required amending, um, there were supposed to be provisions for 140 days and they ran out to biscuits on even the lower supplies, 89 days. When they got their first load of passengers, they might have got sufficient supplies, but then they went to another place and picked up another hundred passengers, and there was the, that's where the skullduggery took place. There were, um, well, I'll show you in the next one, there's 
barrels that had different names on each end of them, split peas on one end and cabin biscuits on the other. So when they've ticked off all the you know number you're meant to have of uh, split peas, they flip the barrels over and, <laughs> and that's the skullduggery that went on for that. So um, as I did actually take stock of what was there and made some changes in how they were distributed for the rest of the voyage so that they didn't starve completely. And uh, there were some uh, nasty findings uh, from the inquiry, but I don't know what the penalties were. So out of that, I think we got some insights into Isaiah's character. Uh, one is that he was a stickler for accurate reporting. Two, he was very quick to respond to the inaccuracies. He didn't let it lie. And he, all along, he's uh, recorded to have shown his concern for his, uh, his passengers and was praised for that. I don't know how he got his messages out in the way so quick, you know. He got the papers the, the day after they were reported and then wrote off and sent that back. And it was, that was a publication about the corrections, not, not just what he wrote. Next by is was the Dilhari um, from uh, London uh, to Australia again. And that boat later was uh, flying uh, between New Zealand and the UK. and. Uh, you can see that it left in May and the arrival was in August and there were 284 statute adults. I don't know what a statute adult is different from any ordinary adult, but it's, I think they add up children and they make them into three of them into an adult as well, something like that. But it's worth another research sometime. But anyway, um, in this place off the coast of South Australia, um, a brandy bottle turns up on the beach and it uh, was picked up by a man from Troala which uh, is only three hours and a bit by a car today but was probably about three days on a horse in those years and uh, the evening star from uh, could be, I think it was probably uh, uh, South Australia oh, well, Portland Guardian sorry uh, this well, the Evening Star here reported an item from the uh, Portland Guardian that um, described the finding of this bottle. It had a message inside it in three <coughs> languages, Greek, English, oh, sorry, English, uh, French and German. The name of the boat from which it, the bark from which it was uh, uh, cast was obliterated by a little bit of deterioration in the bottle. And it gave the latitude and longitude of where it was tossed off and gave instructions for the finder what to do with the message and uh, they which would get hold of the hydrogra hydrography department of the uh, Admiralty in London. So uh, notice he gave his uh, Liverpool address in there and uh, that he said that this uh, activity was in the interests of science. We'll tell you a little bit more about this uh, thinking. Uh, it's the brandy bottle which I might come back to later. But uh, Eventually, as I did receive no word from the Admiralty in London that what had happened and how long this bottle had been around, and uh, it was about three years after it was tossed off the boat. Now, the, the messages, and uh, just while we're on uh, the multilingual uh, polyglot uh, Isaiah, uh, it said in uh, material written after his death that he made his children speak French uh, before breakfast. Yeah. And that's Carmel, jo uh, Carmel Jones, not my, uh, it's quoted there. So I'm still on the subject of multilinguality. This is a, a posthumous comment, uh, which just fits in here, uh, about his advocacy for Greek and medical studies. And the, um, the, the Doctor of Divinity, who actually uh, lived in a place which was two kilometers from where I lived in the Savoy, but um, had a conversation uh, some years ago with the late Dr. De Zeus, done the on medical training, said I would require every young man who wished to enter the study of medicine to have a thorough, thorough elementary knowledge. I'm not sure whether thorough and elementary are actually in, well joined together uh, of Greek, and it would save him hours of work and clarify his knowledge of the terminology. Well, we'll come back to that later. Um, so those are the coordinates uh, of where the bottle was tossed and I figured out from the dates and the like that it had to have been on the return voyage from the Delhari because uh, you know, he'd already arrived in uh, Brisbane before that. So that's where the bottle was tossed and where it went to Australia. 
The next voyage he made, he uh, came back with his 24-year-old wife, who was uh, interestingly daughter of a shipbroker and ship owner. You see the theme of the sea keeps coming through. And uh, the um, <coughs> pair of them voyaged off to uh, uh, Australia again. That's the only photo we have of uh, his wife Mary. And uh, she's listed there in the salon. And he's still surgeon superintendent on the boat. And they got there in, in August. Now, this is, seemed to have been a, a pleasure voyage. The, the, the newspapers didn't have much to do in those days, I think, except go down the walls and report everybody who's coming and going, what's happening, etc. But uh, this particular set of uh, people described an exceptionally uh, splendid passage and uh, that um, it was little else than a pleasure trip. But especially the, um, the uh, deaths were ad are wrongly reported again, and he, these have been corrected. There's one, one woman dies in childbirth <coughs> and uh, three children on that boat. Um, eventually the the passengers are reported to have arrived at destination in a better health condition than what they were taken on to start with. But the original part of the first part of the voyage was uh, um, a lot of illness of a, a non-dangerous type. That's how it's described. Um, so there were other things happening there, which we'll come to. So then uh, the captain had his wife, uh, Mrs. Young, and uh, Mary Dedouche uh, did everything in their power to make this uh, a pleasure voyage and uh, gave lessons on uh, those things there, reading, writing, and sewing, music, and singing, and they even got a choir together by the end of the voyage. And, and the captain and uh, Isaiah uh, gave le uh, plain lectures on some useful subject, uh, so it's like a school trip for people who perhaps had little or no education. And then there was the lady who uh, lost her, one of the ladies who lost her child, they did some acts of charity of raising money for her gathering some clothes because she had a rather poor outfit it said, and then there was the, the seamen's orphans, they, quite a big sum of money was collected on the voyage uh, as well, so they weren't thinking just of themselves. Um, we're still stuck finding out what boat uh, they came from Queensland to New Zealand on. Can't find any records, and yet there's records of every other Tom Dick and Harry who came in the country and the newspapers, papers passed to them. And, uh, but we do know that, uh, you know, that was the arrival time in uh, Britain. He made a notice in the ODT about his intention to travel, so it had to be in that period of time that he came, so he didn't stay long after he registered in Queensland. And the first child was born a year after the arrival in Dunedin, so he's got it done in uh, registration and births and so But probably what uh, he might have seen if he came in at Port Charles, but there's a possibility he could have come in at uh, uh, Littleton or Invercargill and got here some other way. Now, um, he made an intention to uh, register in the, by the first day of December next, and then yet the next. Uh, month, even two week, only two weeks late, he's got uh, a, oh sorry, this one, his um, place, he's going to practice in Mori, uh, Mori Place, and then, uh, I don't know whether that breached the registration act or what, but uh, we're looking further. Well, I left Dr. Stenhouse up there for a more uh, topical reason, and that, that's uh, all of you are going to go for one soon if you haven't already. <laughs> Don't know what they were vaccinating. It was probably smallpox in those days. And there's the children. Now, the, a theme that uh, ran through his life is still current in Dunedin at this moment, but I won't go into that in any more depth. But uh, there was some toings and froings between the hospital start, medical staff and the university. That is probably the, the form of the Dunedin hospital of his arrival here when he uh, came. Um, this was. You know, he came in 77, 11 years after that, so there wasn't a new hospital built till a bit after that. So probably that's a, a deduction. There was a, a new medical school developing, which we talked about last time, and uh, here was Professor Milan Kotri, who was appointed as the uh, lecturer in anatomy and the like. And he had six students to start with and got whittled down to two by the following year. Uh, this was the inaugural lecture in the middle of the year, and then 
uh, by the beginning of the next year, there's only um, Dr. Dr. Kloss, uh, sorry, he was Joseph Osborne Kloss there, uh, as a qualified one student, one professor, one classroom, and one cadaver. <laughs> you might remember that. The, the, med sorry, the medical superintendent was uh, Dr. Edward Holman. He supervised the uh, boats and uh, health of the and quarantine issues down at the port. And uh, he was the one who said that there was no shortage of cadavers for learning anatomy on an even hospital, 150 bed hospital, procured with unusual facility. Coetry resigned a couple of years after that because he was in conflict with the university. He was not meant to be private practicing, but he had little, too little to do with not much in the way of student care. And uh, went off and he was replaced by John Halliday Scott, who's the subject of the next uh, few uh, slides. John Halliday Scott uh, was a professor of anatomy, but he wrote a letter to the hospital medical staff committee and the university council, which provoked a letter to the editor of the ODT very shortly afterwards, signed by four of the then of, of the of the then medical staff. And it also provoked. I'm not sure whether it could have been in the pipeline already or not, or whether it was provoked by this. Uh, uh, tension going on and a commission of inquiry into education for the universities in general and uh, the preparation towards university from schools and then medical education specifically. So this is the letter of Dr Scott and the two main things to bring out is that he was requiring the medical staff of the hospital to turn up on certain fixed days to be available to give uh, a tuition to students. Now these people were all honorary staff members of the hospital and they had private practices as well, and for him to be actually dictating that these are the days you've got to be there was not quite to their liking, unless they were going to be paid, guess what, fees. <laughs> and uh, there, there is the problem that the medical school was recognised only on the basis, in the home country, back in the UK it was actually Edinburgh, it was only recognised on the basis that it had 150 beds for teaching and learning. And if only a few of them were in use at a time, because only a few docs turned up on certain times and days, the students weren't getting exposed to all, all, all the possibilities. And those are the main points about that. Signing of certificates was another factor in it. But um, these four gentlemen wrote this letter to the editor, which used some language which I think is uh, quite interesting. I've taken a few bits off there, but it said that at the meeting of the Council of the University of Otago on the 8th inst, an ebullition, ebullition of temper and expression took place, which did not add to the dignity of the occasion or to that of the individual gentleman from whose these emanated. The language is interesting. This uncalled for exhibition of feeling resulted from the reading of a letter from Professor Scott. Some members of the University Council have been led to express themselves in such extraordinary and insulting language in speaking of the proposed students' hospital fees as it is a scandalous exaction, I am ashamed of the medical men of this city and did not think them capable of such a thing. The dignity of such remarks will be duly ju judged by an unbiased public. So it was really written to gain public sympathy. And the rest, it, it's many pages long, uh, printed out. I don't know how much of the column of the ODT, uh, what was ODT, it took, but the subject of fees and how much was paid in the home country for medical tuition was the rest of the subject matter. So the, the heading of that letter is uh, Audial Terum Partium, which in Latin is, is translated to a principle of law, really, that uh, listen to the other side, let the other side be heard as well. Uh, a fair hearing, as they were implying. Uh, so we've covered most of that, but there's quite a bit in it about the two students. One of them is spoken of favourably as turning up as much as he possibly could. That's uh, Joseph Kloss to get whatever learning and teaching he could at any time. But the other guy was a little bit easy ozy and they weren't prepared to write his certificate of attendance. Uh, that's in that uh, letter, I mentioned in that letter too. So we've, we've covered Dr. Cross previously. <coughs> a couple of months later, they had this Royal Commission uh, uh, inquiring into the schools of the colony, so it's not specific to Dunedin. Although the only university of New Zealand was in, in Dunedin, Otago at the time. 
and uh, if you look at uh, the highlighted bits, the term fees took a lot of the uh, cross-examination of uh, Isaiah as a witness. He was the last witness the hearing heard and uh, they wanted to know many things about what Dr. Scott, what Professor Scott might have meant in his letter and uh, they assumed that he meant they had to turn up at certain times. Um, so moving on then, uh, not too long after that there were uh, a couple of the medical staff who, who uh, were looking at uh, appointments in the university medical school but we know that um, uh, Isaiah didn't get any of the ones that are mentioned there so that was uh, 83 and it was actually another five years before he got appointed as, a, as the first uh, uh, clinical, uh, clinical lecturer in uh, the ch disease of children it was called um, he, he wrote to the hospital a number of times trying to encourage them to let him take over the children's care and the children's outpatients uh, as this is they call it outdoor department and eventually the hospital committee trustees allowed that to happen but that's still before he was appointed the, the next year as that clinical lecturer. Just briefly he took on many roles, got engaged in many activities only a few of which are going to come out further but um, he he was both secretary and uh, president of the Otago branch of the New Zealand Medical Association, and attended many of their meetings and presented papers at many of them. Um, there was a med new medical bill being uh, designed at the time, which is about registration of practitioners, and there was quite a lot of uh, tussle between him as, uh, in one of his roles, either secretary or president, and the pharmacy guild or pharmacy representatives. There was things in there that uh, each party didn't like of the other, but I haven't put any more in about that, there's too much else. This is off, off piece I think, um, I don't know why he was interested in inventing an improvement for lamps that burn combustible oils, it didn't seem to come to anything, but as a, you can see there's thousands and thousands of uh, these come up and they get presented to the both houses at that time, the General Assembly. Um, um, that is about uh, when he was uh, finally appointed as the lecturer in uh, diseases of uh, children. But again, that is stuff that all went up to Parliament uh, to get approved. Uh, there is a, a writing out there from Jeff Watson, who was a paediatrician, it was uh, 2006, uh, that describes all of the paediatric. Uh, uh, traverse in, in New Zealand, starting with Isaiah de Zouche as the first, and I have to say with some pleasure I saw a classmate of mine as the last in that list who was the Professor of Paediatrics at Auckland. But um, looking at our education in the university, medical education in the university, this treatise by Donald Simpson which was written in 20, uh, 2000, made some comparisons and you can note first of all that uh, Otago was ahead of Adelaide in, uh, in uh, the paediatric teaching and uh, that um, Isaiah's choice of textbooks were in fact uh, English not, um, not Scottish so it makes the comment that there was the dominance of English authors for the studies uh, in, a, in a, done, a Scottish medical school. <coughs> He became the president of the Royal Society, uh, which has had some origins here in Otago. That photo, the provenance of which is uh, is still unknown, but it's a not certainly not the best of photos of Isaiah. But the, the Otago branch of the Royal Society was really called the Otago Institute to start with. But there's some famous names in there that you might recognise, and uh, they um, were. They were resistant to joining the, uh, or they're being capitulated to Wellington for as long as they possibly could, which is what that last little bit is about. <coughs> so he uh, got nobbled to be president at one time by the preceding president, who, as he left, uh, this gentleman gave this uh, lecture, uh, Cos Cosmogony Constructed by Lucretius, and I don't know whether any scholars here can help me what, know what that means, because I don't yet. And... Um, 
he was a bit, as he said, reticent to take it on. He joined this society to learn what he could about science rather than actually to be a major contributor. He's probably been quite modest because he contributed quite considerably following that. But um, uh, well, maybe it's on this one. He accepted uh, with some misgivings and uh, uh, accepted that he would uh, have the welfare at heart and the greatest interest in the advancement of science and uh, would do what he could, anything he could to advance the interests of the institute while he was in office. And okay, so that was the end of the preceding president. The next one, he is in the chair. And um, interesting, one of the people present was Sir James Hector, who has quite a famous uh, position in New Zealand history, amongst uh, other things. But uh, Dr. Fred Chapman uh, was uh, chair of the hospital trustees, which he appeared in the, the last talk I did. And so was uh, the said Professor Scott, so they're probably not uh, too distant by then. And uh, so as I um, has to give his talk uh, from the chair. It's a 90-minute presentation, and uh, it was uh, the subject bacteria and their relationship to disease. Uh, and this is just a little bit before viruses were described. I'll just read out the first bit of his paper, which was then um, uh, published. It will help help us to better understand the widespread revolution in pathological views or doctrines occasioned by the discovery of bacterial agency and disease. If we glance at some of the theories which were formerly held regarding the nature of disease, theories which still lurk in the belief of certain classes of the people, just as old styles in dress and old-fashioned modes of speech are found amongst them long after they have become obsolete in the centres of fashion and learning. <laughs> So, um, in, in, in the history of medicine, disease was attributed to alterations of the humours of the body. We pretty much know that. The cardinal humours were for blood, phlegm, uh, yellow bile or black bile. So, the paper is, uh, is long and he ended up uh, with a statement which sounded quite uh, interesting. Uh, but civilization, civilization is a slow process. Disease in one class of society may affect all classes. Disease in one family may affect several families. Nothing but a widespread liberal education, a socialism of knowledge, can ultimately eradicate disease. That's available online if anybody should want to find it. And uh, 24 pages, so I'm not going to redo that, but he might have been pleased to see that the article immediately ahead of his had some Greek in it. Uh, there was no mention of viruses or the immune systems in terms of disease, but it's that paper was given three years before the first uh, description of virus, which was tobacco mosaic virus, of which they had the centenary in uh, 1992, commemorating those two gentlemen who were the sort of first describers. It was thought to have been a fluid to start with before they actually got down to the particulate nature of viruses. Now, Sir James Hector, just in brief, he was a surgeon as well as a geo uh, ecologist and uh, uh, ge geologist and carried out his studies in Edinburgh, but he was quite well described for the Palliser expedition across Canada, which was quite a long uh, long one, and there's a, 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 route, a, a myth about uh, him kicking horse pass where he's supposed to have fallen off and the like, but there is doubt, some doubt about the myth as well. So kicking horse pass was named after that event for him. And when he first came to um, New Zealand, he carried out the... Uh, three-year survey in Otago, which was at the beginning of the gold findings. And uh, he uh, really looked after the most uh, prestigious scientific institute in New Zealand uh, for a long time, but was also Chancellor of the University, and I think possibly in that role was he at the uh, meeting where Isaiah gave his uh, paper on uh, bacteria and disease. Oh, I 
so that's going to go. Right, so some of the other uh, social issues that Isaiah wrote on, uh, social and practical, involve hydatids, uh, sanitation and science and things like that. I'll show you a couple of them. Uh, that's uh, a case report of a uh, uh, suppurating hydatid lung, and I went through all his uh, records in the archives, and there's a lot of this type of thing described in there. It didn't say hydatid per se, but it you know, suppurating empyemas and all sorts of things in the lungs and other parts of the body. Now, we had a, we had a meeting of um, the Australian Association of the Advancement of Science. Uh, his paper was the third listed uh, behind those ones you see there under the sanitary science and hygiene section. Somebody talked about house sanitation in uh, Sydney, um, drainage and sewage, uh, disposal of sewage in Christchurch, and then he is the one on the registration of disease. Effectively, he um, he was uh, trying to make a case for the state taking responsibility for recording diseases uh, uh, with, with a view to promote the better treatment of diseases or to their prevention. If it appears that legislation can lessen its prevalence or diminish its effects, it is clearly the duty of the state to pass such laws as may attain that end. To medical men, the study of the diseases of the nervous system um, uh, it is unnecessary to prove that Sorry, I'm reading from the inebriety paper. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> we'll get onto that. It's there. Um, uh, the study of the diseases of the nervous system is unnecessary to prove that inebriety is a disease, just as epilepsy, hysteria are, are diseases. This is far from being understood by the general public, whose ignorance of its true nature is reflected in the laws passed for punishment of habitual drunkards. Well, that's pretty advanced thinking for the time because uh, you know, even in DSM-5 recently published the ability, the attempt to try and uh, decriminalise or uh, to take away the, the, the mal, mal behaviour aspect of, uh, of substance use disorders and alcoholism and treating it as a disease is still a work in progress, I think. Uh, it's a long treatise again which he... Uh, read at uh, New, Zealand uh, New Zealand Institute. Uh, this is one that should interest uh, one of my colleagues here who has given the this, this stuff. I have never delivered ether, but uh, I'm not going to spend a long time on this paper, which is quite lengthy, a treatise on ether as an anaesthetic. It was really the debate and argument about which was the best to be using, ether or chloroform. And ether is a lot. Uh, more difficult to give, uh, maybe not as effective than chloroform, but it, the safety of ether was what he was promoting primarily against the pleasantness of chloroform. Remember, Queen Victoria had chloroform a few, one or two or a few times. Um, he said that he'd inhaled it himself to have some teeth taken out. I think that had to have been in the in America because he talks about uh, about 20 years ago, and I worked out that uh, he would have been. Um, uh, somewhere after he graduated and records we don't have yet of what he went to America for, obviously his family were based there, he has a brother who was a, uh, a type of physician, I would say just a type of physician, it's um, not quite formally qualified I think um, and uh, the paper does show a very scholarly approach to this and it also shows that uh, with these six rules for best practice he clearly had experience behind them. They weren't just generalisations, they had very practical um, commentary in there. Now just take, he, he favoured ether obviously and said that whenever he gave anaesthetic he could do that himself but here's a case which is um, very unfortunate but um, this gentleman arrives with a strangulated inguinal hernia in the afternoon. Dr. Zazush uh, sees him shortly after his arrival and uh, they describe in the next part of the record that operating on him, assisted by Dr. Monsal, we've seen, and Dr. Copeland, they used uh, what was called Bill Roth's mixture of um, al alcohol, uh, chloroform and ether to try and ameliorate some of the bad effects of the one. But, uh, they gave it in small quantities because this man is an extremist. He's got a huge amount of bowel in the scrotum. And uh, they didn't even remove him from the ward. They did it there and there in the ward. Made an incision for half the length of the scrotum, 
the patient was described as being very low during the operation. We had to splash cold water over the face, and he came round again, and then they were able to get on and continue the operation. It sounds horrific. Uh, it describes too much bowel out to put it all back, and I don't know what their intention was, but the next <laughs> bit of the record says that the patient did not rally but died about 15 minutes or so later. So that is even trying to get away from pure chloroforming, and I saw chloroformed mentioned many times through his case records in the archive, so he was possibly more the surgeon in the case and not got the control over it, but uh, despite the plug for ether, that's what, what I saw. Now, who knows what Batty's procedure is? It was on the previous slide, I let it go. <laughs> uh, what does going Batty mean? Ovaries, yes. Uh, it, it, it's some... Um, yeah, that, that's it. That's the theme. It's probably quite derogatory and unkind in modern knowledge terms. However, um, he gave a report of an operation he did here uh, by taking out both ovaries. And there's a description of the woman having um, severe abdominal pain, which he thought was neuroma pain of the ovaries. But the naughty thing was that he described this being the first of this operation done in the Australian colonies. It was right here in Dunedin, so I don't object to being part of Australian colonies. But, uh, so he came. He gave a follow-up to that because the, the original report was a bit premature. And the, in the follow-up, he um, has a review of literature relating to the subject, etc. And uh, the lady got quite a lot better. Uh, but it took quite a while. Originally he thought he, she had a neuroma from where the surgery was and he was quite advanced to think about mentioning phantom limb pain as a reason for that. Well it was probably neuro nerve damage pain anyway but uh, by the time uh, he reported this three years later she was perfectly well and milked seven cows every day and did, did a lot of other heavy, heavy duty work. Uh, and uh, again it's a very thoughtful paper um, because this next uh, item here, which is very recent uh, uh, thesis from uh, uh, Adelaide, uh, from Notre Dame in Australia, the uh, uh, rather unkind treatment of uh, women in mental institutions, asylums as they called them in those days, and uh, he is sort of credited with writing up this uh, this type of, but these people that were being inhumanely treated were not straight out um, you know, diseased ovaries. They are talking about taking out normal ovaries to try and cure their battiness. It got named after Sir Robert Batty, and Isaiah de Zouche gave a strong plug for him being, uh, his name, Batty's name being associated with it as the first person to do it. The evil habit, uh, Isaiah declined to do a, a circumcision on a boy who's of seven whose father brought him there because he was masturbating too much. This is a coroner's typing inquiry. He was beaten to death and maltreated by his parents because of his evil habit. Uh, so, a, a quick run through case reports. Some of you have seen those two spoons before. Um, mistaken dose error. Uh, what was described, uh, prescribed as a teaspoon got heard and given by the woodsman as a tablespoon, which is a three times greater dose. I am surprised the, the death because it was uh, atropine and I wouldn't have thought atropine was as toxic as that, but that's the report in the, in the news. Uh, this is the book. I put that one out and for a particular reason. This lady has a large ab incision or ab an abscess on the top of her arm and into the axilla. And uh, the first thing to note, I think, is that um, the, the time span, noting that uh, this is a continuation from another page, so this is the time span from January to April, all the things that are happening to over that period of time, but also quite long intervals in the records, not daily care. They might be prescribing daily dressings or whatever, but they are, she, got, she got seen quite intermittently. That's the first thing. The second thing is the, the spectrum of poisons that they put on wounds to try and heal them, <laughs> uh, or, or combat infection. And then the galvanic battery is uh, quite interesting because uh, you know, we haven't had much about electrotherapy in medicine uh, up until that time. This is um, late 1800s, 
And the last thing is that uh, again the patient was put under chloroform and uh, a very large um, incision made and Terry will probably understand the anatomy of from the clavicle to the trapezius at the back, <laughs> somewhere in the axilla, that's a lot of space and a lot of uh, pipes and nerves in that, in that area. There are replicates of this type of record all through the, the archive for, uh, book, and this is a lady with thysis, thysis is a, is a tuber tuberculosis, syphilis, and thruma is a massive goiter in the neck. And uh, there's very nice drawings. I think they have used a stamp to put that in. It looks very uh, clean and irregular as if they've stamped and drawn over it. The, find, the physical findings, but quite exquisite detail of the physical findings. No x rays, no stethoscope, tapping, noise of sounds, and that's all they had at their disposal. Lots of prescriptions for this uh, 27 year old, and this is one of the, this prescription here has a mixture of powders of opium, something that makes you sick, and digitalis, quinine, and made into a pill and taken three times a day. I honestly can't see what the good that would do. <laughs> And there. So, I, unfortunately, our colleague uh, of that name, I do the name, and because he uh, comes to our meetings <laughs> quite often, I thought it would be nice to bring up a ghost for this <laughs> in the past. But anyway, this is another one with TB, and you'll see that in about a, a two week time span, this patient just uh, had it in and out of being described as good or bad, temperature up, temperature down, slept, didn't sleep, and then finally died after 17 days and I don't think there was a lot of help, hope for them at that point of time except for some of them got their chest collapsed and they did a bit better from that. <coughs> I'm going to have to stop doing that button. Now who knows what that plant is. <coughs> I'm getting close to time so I have to rush. It's tutu. Somebody say that. Yes, tutu. Tutu is poisonous. It's every part of it just about is poisonous. And uh, it's, it's a tree and they have described a poison from it which is effective on the nervous system causing these uh, adverse things like convulsions and breathing problems. And the next case is about a man called David, 45 years, who lived in a tent at Kelso, made some tutu jam, took one spoonful which sent him to sleep at once, good anaesthetic maybe, uh, woke up feeling pain in his right eye, found his tent was on fire <laughs> and had just enough time to escape but was severely burnt. And he didn't get to the hospital until about uh, three days later. So they treated him with all sorts of things. Carom oil is um, uh, linseed oil, I think linseed oil, and pult poultices, zinc ointments and the like. But I was intrigued by the number of grafts, gra skin grafts they took for him. Um, Operated on again, big contractures after the uh, after the burns, and a very large incision made under here to allow the gentleman to be able to get his arm back above his shoulder again. And it was held up in a sling on the rail of the bed. Still the old uh, oiled silk uh, dressings over the grass and the like. He's described as discharge cured, I think, discharged alive, likely, <laughs> but a lot of disability I think left in that. Now he's done Eden residences, I'll have to whip through fast. Uh, this article in the ODT of 2019 described the picture of this house, a stunning or uh, mind-blowing villa. What's that real estate got to do with Dr. Dezouche? Well, uh, that uh, house was originally built on a section up uh, Tennyson, uh, near Tennyson Street, just down uh, View Street from Tennyson. It's easier if I show you the uh, map in a moment, but these are the people that had lived in it beforehand. Uh, the, the Dr. Edward Holm, uh, who could uh, acquire cadavers with a facility. Um, I think that from the dates and that, it's likely that Isaiah lived in there shortly after he arrived, because uh, it was uh, 1877 and a uh, leading art dealer. But Dr. George Emery in the uh, next century dismantled this house when it was going to be bowled over and shifted it. If you know where Tennyson Street is on Otago Girls, and there are some, only some steps. They couldn't get a truck up to Moray Place or View Street to get the book, so they were carried, hand carried all the bits of materials down the steps to the top of there's uh, North Street, what's that one? Dowling. Uh, uh, Dowling Street. You know the steps down there? That, and then they were mm -hmm. carted away. It's stored in Mornington on 
Dr. Emery's property and left for quite a few years before they put them together. Every piece was numbered, etc. So just to orient you a little bit, uh, this is um, Moray Place in here and uh, View Street and uh, the main road, uh, Princess Street. And then some may have heard of the sanatorium up there and uh, Otago Girls, uh, Otago, the original Otago Boys was there, that later became the girls school. That building there, what is it now? An afternoon tea place, well what a, that's a great <laughs> idea. Um, it's got a view maybe. This is the Savoy building today. Oh. And uh, these two uh, things are relative to each other so that you can identify that chimney to put you into the place of the next picture. There's that chimney again there. And this is the house we're talking about. This is where Dr. Bazouche and those others lived. Uh, there were not so many surrounding houses there. And further down the street, uh, Dr. Bazouche um, uh, had his practice and I think it was probably in this bit of land here which I'll, sh I'll show you those buildings shortly um, he gave notice uh, that he was going to move into this other house of Dr Blair well you've seen that before haven't you um, uh, it's on the corner of uh, Albany Street opposite the Rob Roy area and um, it's had a string of medical people live in it in this city Isaiah after Dr. Blair, then uh, Dr. Kloss from the last one, he was living in that when he died, and then Dr. De La Tour came down from Omaru, lived in it, and there's been countless medical people and pra dental practices in there since. Um, this is a bit anachronistic because it's post mortem for Isaiah, but it, um, it describes the properties that were in his estate for sale after he died and uh, those are the two that he owned that are described over here. That was the Asian restaurant. Uh, it's described as a two-storey building that had a little bit put on the top of it. That little bit there, I suspect. This, I think, is not the building that he owned that's been put on. He owned one next door, but it's been, that's a, new, a more modern version. Leaving New Zealand, we've got to get to the end of the story. Uh, a, Isaiah packed up in uh, mid-93 and travelled on the Nensha back to the UK. You see he took his wife and two of his daughters out of uh, five daughters and one son surviving. And uh, then a bit later he travelled on the Germanic uh, to Philadelphia and as shown up here he went with uh, his wife and an 11 year old child. That's the Germanic. And I'm going to give you a little quiz. Anybody like to identify those, either of those two gentlemen or both? Getting short of time. Everybody willing to stay? Sush on the left. No, not true. Uh, but good, good try because you've got a beard and all that sort of stuff. Um, all right, well, Silas Weir Mitchell is the one on the left. And uh, Stephen Waxman is the one on the right. Now, Mitchell comes up again shortly for Dr. Dezouche, but uh, he was the one who, uh, sorry, Mitchell described um, a lot of things in uh, neurology and the like, but erythromyalgia is this condition of red limbs. And uh, erythros from red, melos from limbs, and algos for pain. So it's really a, a, a description of what you see turned into another language. Or and Stephen Waxman, uh, is the person who has found the gene mutation that causes that condition. It's found in 50% of them. The other 50% they haven't identified what's causing it, but it's, it's um, thought to be maybe acquired. It's a, a sodium channel channelopathy problem and it's important in pain, pain knowledge. Chasing Men on Fire, the story of the search for the pain gene is a book written by Stephen Waxman continuing the story. Now, uh, so Weir Mitchell was a physician, scientist, novelist, and poet, and there's some of the works from him. But important to this story is the um, neurasthenia, hysteria, and of course, causalgia was um, described in, uh, for the American Civil War injuries and bullet, bullet wounds through the brachial plexus, and they get burning pain in the limb. But you'll notice that uh, he wrote some interesting stuff on fat and blood and, and treatment of certain forms of neurasthenia. 
and, uh, and hysteria. So uh, that's where this falls into uh, Isaiah's picture. He was known as Dr. Diet and Dr. Quiet for some of the treatment types he used. He was the father of modern neurology. Uh, so isolation bed rest and high fat diet is the treatment of fish and chips every night. This is the book, The Rest and the Treatment of Nervous Disease. And uh, this, uh, long before Isaiah even went there, they had this uh, spa, special water from the Clifton Springs to uh, help people with their health. It uh, has a religious basis uh, as well. And uh, Isaiah went back to the UK to visit, um, probably to connect with his, sorry, to the US, to uh, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to connect with his family. And he went to Dr. Silas Weir for help with his neurasthenia, which uh, will come out a little bit better when I read the uh, obituary in a moment. Because it tells you about his character, but what, what troubles he had as well. Um, this is published in the New Zealand Medical Journal the following year. No man worked harder for the benefit of his fellow practitioners. No man has been more uns un unsparing of his own energies in his duty towards his patients. No man has been more honourable, more considerate, or more conscientious, sorry, or more respected than Dr. Dezusha of Dunedin. Chosen president of the Targo branch of the New Zealand Medical Association on more than one occasion, and his kindly disposition and love of hard work led to his acceptance of all manner of troublesome, laborious, and unpaid <coughs> positions that his less energetic colleagues <coughs> showered upon him. His prof pro prof professional work was characterised by the most uh, scrupulous attention to detail. He made a point of always being prepared for every conceivable difficulty that might arise in the cases he undertook. In midwifery and in operative work, this was particularly noticeable. His unceasing application to duty, acting upon a more than usually highly strung nervous organisation, at length began to tell upon his health. That dread enemy, insomnia, came with pitiless persistence upon him. His practice suffered seriously from his enforced absence, and finally, for the sake of his health, he had to give up the work he loved so well. After travelling home to the old country, he went to America and placed himself under the care of Dr. Weir Mitchell, the noted specialist in neurotic affections. Afflictions, I think it should be. So that was uh, a very short interval, no retirement, 54 years of age, or 55, and the epilogue is that his wife uh, lived for another 30 years or so afterwards and uh, can be found back in Liverpool uh, with her son, their son, who was an accountant. There are no medical offspring in his family, and she died, um, no, it wasn't about 30 years, it was 20 odd years. So I will leave you with the thought about the brandy bottle. If you want to buy one now, it's still available online for a nice little sum. Thank you for listening and staying a bit longer. Christians. David, can you tell us anything about his treatment of children? I couldn't find in the records uh, what of that, so whether there's a separate archive record book, I don't know. Well, there are a few actually, there's like a 13 year old there, that's the only one I, only one that I saw. Um, there was a whole lot of stuff that I thought should have been there that's not there. Like appendicitis, I mean, it was common things happen frequently, and I could see no cases of appendicitis like that. So children that should, should come up sometime. But I'm going to keep looking at the further. You must have had a struggle in establishing the specialty of paediatrics. I'm right in thinking at that time, yeah. you know, the general physicians really thought that um, they should just be dealing with children like little adults. And um, so That's quite right. paediatrics yeah. was, uh, uh, had a trouble in establishing it, itself. It did, and that article by Jeff Weston actually highlights that a bit further. But the other thing is that after he resigned, the um, the university decided to send him a thanking letter, which actually was well after he had left the country. <laughs> and they decided not to replace uh, a lecturer in disease and children 
So it's quite a long time after that before there was a further specialty. Mm. I've got the history of that. Yeah. Yeah. Must we know it? With regard to the specialist recognition, it's my recollection, I wasn't there of course, but I read all about it, <laughs> that um, the physicians and surgeons mm. took patients on a day-by-day day day basis, so that if a physician was taking patients for the day, was a surgical patient, he would well operate on that patient as well in detail, management, if a surgeon took the patient. And I seem to remember in approaching the book about one of the physicians was very pleased with a kidney operation he had performed on some, on some patient, which is mm. you know, quite strange in our more recent uh, sort of way we operate. Mm. Yeah. Well, he had to practice all dead people. <laughs> um, there, there were advertised regularly in the ODT uh, days of taking patients at the hospital. Uh, for the dead ones. ones? No, no, no. Not Sorry. Not <laughs> many of those. No, I'm talking about Ledwich, the School of Anatomy, where they then got the certificate for being able to operate. <laughs> um, but they, they did have... Uh, Rotating the doctors available on various days, small, very small groups of them. Right at the very beginning of your your talk, you had a throwaway line about him being either taught or examined by a New Zealand. Hmm? I missed that. Okay. Um, oh, how easy can I get back? I yeah, can get back to that. Um, the, the list of uh, examiners in the in the College of Surgeons in, of England uh-huh. included a New Zealander. It's about there. Oh, I see. Yes. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I rushed through it. I don't know that name. I yeah. looked it up further. And he gave his address as Pennsylvania, like one other person in the, in the cohort that passed from oh, that exam. Yes, yes. Mm, thanks for that. Oh, because, yes, yes. The um, relapsing fever paper, I don't know when, the, I mean, Liverpool would have had lots of tropical stuff coming in with sailors, so malaria. Uh, it's a, I haven't read the paper, uh, but it's a, a good guess, I think, because, as you say, they were a big seaport. I think you're right, probably that's a little, malaria. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a little project right. for you for one of these talks sometime. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm the second person to see these, Good. I was thinking there'd be one more tonight. But. <laughs> question? David, that was just great. It really was. So really enjoyable and so fantastically well researched. So please join me in thanking David.